even before the reading of the scriptures. Our Heavenly Father, we approach thee now, Lord Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, for thy blessed spirit and how that he moves through the hearts of born-again believers in Christ. Father, as pastor of this church, as I look out over these faces of brothers and sisters in Christ whom we've come to know and to love in the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, even as we look out into many faces that less than a year ago, Father, were doomed and damned to a crisis eternity without hope, without the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, Father, over these months as we've seen them come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, as we watched him grow in grace, O oh, Father, to thee we give the praise and the glory and the adoration, and might they be used greatly as they go forth. We know, Father, that the time for the service of Jesus is now, and the hours grow precious as the time seems to draw nigh unto the place and the time when we'll not be able to expound the word. Possibly, Father, even men and women that sat in this congregation tonight may be taken and put into prison. And yes, Father, even have to lay down their lives for the witness of Christ. Oh, Father, fill us. Give us stamina, understanding, and a love for Jesus in a weld of knit one with the other. And Father, we know that though the imps of hell can rage against us, they cannot prevail against the saint. They cannot defeat thy purpose that we might stay before thy throne, pray with intercessory prayer unto thee. And Father, tonight, give us understanding, wisdom as we study, and we'll bless thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as we go on with the fifth church, here in the book of the Revelations, we've been studying from the churches. <clears throat> tonight, as we begin in chapter 3, chapter 3, verses... 1 through 6, dealing with the church at Sardis. Verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are all ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on th to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white remnant. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We see this church here tonight dealing in, in the book of Revelation. This church is the time and the period of the Reformation. This deals with a time along when Martin Luther came in October the 1st. The Reformation began in 1517. And then along, the Reformation moved on until about the 1750s. Now, during the time that Martin Luther, as he had come and stepped forth and had denounced Catholicism, had denounced the, many of the false teachings, and he went and tacked up his 95 theses on the Windenburg church door, and as they had told him, either you recant and denounce what you said and apologize to the Roman Catholic Church, etc., etc. And Martin Luther stood and said, I can not recant. And the Reformation began to move on. Now this church tonight in verse 1, we find his title, Christ's title. He that hath the seven spirits of God and seven stars. Now, the seven spirits, as we have started out, he used this 
in the opening book of the Revelation here, the opening chapters, and we found how that these uh, seven spirits is speaking class of the seven various powers of the Holy Spirit, magnified offices of the Holy Spirit as he administers unto our lives and unto the churches and such. Now in Zechariah chapter 4 and verses 6 through 10, Zechariah chapter 4 verses 6 through 10, speaking of the spirit and power of God. In verse 6 of Zechariah chapter 4, he said, uh, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it. Now in verse 7, speaking of Christ coming in his great second coming, as he's coming in great power, the headstone. This is the one that the chief cornerstone, headstone, the elected foundation that stands sure and true, Christ Jesus. In verse 8, he said, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now this plummet or the plumb line of the judgment of God one day when that line is straight and sure it will separate the righteous and the wicked. The judgment of God that standeth sure. But the seven spirits speaking of the seven various offices of the Holy Spirit. Now the seven stars, as we went back into, was the seven angels, or the seven, uh, speaking of the seven of the uh, pastorates of the churches that are named here. Now the reason he gave this title in this particular book, here in this chapter, each one of these churches have a different name, if you notice. They use a different title to Christ Jesus. Now when he gives this, the stars or the messenger of the church, the pastor in ministry, you'll find that as the Holy Spirit works through the ministers of the leadership of the church, and we have no power aside from the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says, this is he that hath the seven spirit and the seven stars in his hand, in other words. We find that it takes this divine operation of both the Holy Spirit, divine power upon the stars or the messengers of the church to relay the word and the things that God would have wrought onto his churches. So we've seen his title there. Also in verse 1, you find his commendation. He said, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Now class, when he's speaking of this, you'll find here he says, Thou hast a name. I know thy works, and thou hast a name. You know, to most people in churches, this is everything to them. If they've got a big name and a big operation before man. Now he said, I know that thou hast made a name. You've got great things as far as the world's concerned. But he went on after he said, Thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. He said this thing that's coming along here, that during the Reformation period, they went from the uh, hierarchy into a cold formalism, which was branching on down. They were coming from uh, the church as a whole, coming from evangelistical, and gospel messages, they moved down under the headship of the hierarchy and began to knuckle down to authority heads over them. And from this, they went down into the coal formalism to where things were set upon formality. 
And then from this, they went to deadness. And what was this dead? They came right on down into infant baptism for salvation, water baptism or regeneration, good works for salvation. You see what was happening? The gospel message was being stilled slowly. They were being exalted up as a name of a church. And they were getting predominantly well known, if I might put it this way. So that you'll understand what I'm getting at. That their name, they were becoming well known around about the vicinities and around the world. In fact, they even come to the point of where this was what they judged the spirituality of a church on. They judge the spirituality of a church on their numbers. And I'm all for numbers to get them saved. They judge their spirit, spirituality of a church on the amount of property they have. I believe in property of necessity to expand. But if it's at the price of souls, what we judge the spirituality of the churches on is on how are they growing spiritually how are they growing in the word of God? How many souls are being won to Jesus? How many people's lives are being transformed? How, many, how much in the various vicinities of the churches that are going out, what is the contention of the world round about them? I say, what's the contention of the world round about them? You know as well as I do that the feeling towards the Bath Baptist Church round about this community, they hate us. They don't like us. Why? I'm speaking the unsaved world doesn't want you as long as you leave them alone. Why, goodness sakes, if you didn't drive up there and say something, you know you need to be saved. You're going to die in your sins and go to hell. Now you leave me alone. That's all that, that's all that church talks about. Donna. Getting saved, getting saved. Leave me alone. See, and, and it makes a rebellion. Well, good. Praise the Lord. If this is what our operational job is, if you're going to do the work of the Lord, and when a church is in a community and in an area, and if I can walk up and down the streets, if I'm in a meeting, I can walk up and down the streets knocking doors, inviting people out to revival meeting and such, and if, uh, and if they're on church to unsaved people, if, if about... 60-70% uh, of them aren't mad at me for coming and inviting them. I, I think something wrong. That church has been kind of dead. You see, because, boy, where the, where the Lord is, there's might, there's power, there's conviction. But they had great names. They were set up, and then they come into this formalism. I had, I had a lady tell them, she said, you're, she said, you're not very formal. I said, well, I said, what's formalism? Because I didn't preach with a long-tailed robe on. Like I said, you know, I look like Batman up here if you ever put me in a robe. I, now, I know, I know gospel preaching men that preach with a robe on. Well, that's their business. And they preach the gospel message. But me, I'd get tangled up in that thing. I'd stumble over that planter, fall flat on my face, run around. I'd probably take off, get them old wings going on that robe. But see, now, what was the, what's the difference? Putting a robe on my back and looking, looking dignified with it isn't going to hide the fact that I'm ignorant. I only know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Put a robe on doesn't make a bit of difference. Lord save me, put a tie on me, a white collar. Well, He gave me a new life in His Son, Jesus Christ. Behold, all things are passed away and all things become new. But He didn't give me a PhD or a DD or anything else. He gave me a gospel message to preach. See, but they came in cold, cold formalism. Now, I believe that things should be done decently in order in the house of the Lord. But when they get into a formalism, this is what they were bringing in, see. And the synagogues had gotten it even before, uh, even before Martin Luther, even before Catholicism. This is what, when we spoke about the Pharisees and such, that's what they had. They wanted the uppermost seats at the feast. They wanted the front row in the synagogue. See, they were becoming formalism. They stood up formally and read through the entire laws of Moses every Sunday, or every Sabbath, I should say, every Saturday. They read all the way through the laws of Moses, but it didn't mean one thing to them. They denounced, they didn't know what it meant. They were spiritually blind. 
And like we said Sunday night, was preaching. The blind leading the blind, they both fall in the ditch. So from cold formalism that they came into, he said, then they went into deadness because they no longer were preaching a living gospel of a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. But they were preaching a dead gospel, the gospel of man, the gospel of baptismal regeneration, the gospel of good works, and so on and so forth. Dead, see? Now watch as he come on down. We have the same thing today. I want you to note that this church gained a great reputation before man, and there was a form of uh, godliness, and yet they denied the power of the truth of the gospel. Everything appeared and appealed well to the observation of men, but they still did not have a message. They were dead, God said. Dead because they no longer were exalting the power. He said, a name, thou hast a name, and thou livest. Thou had a name to live. The name of Jesus Christ to be exalted, and thou, when you exalt the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, you have a living gospel that you're preaching. But they had come, you had a name, but you had not a principle of life. They had a name, yet the little had they done about the life of men and women needing to be born again of the Spirit of Christ. And he said, because of this, he said that thou art ready to die. Ready to die. Churches dying spiritually day by day, week by week, and year by year. Churches that have had and maintained great works for the Lord Jesus Christ. In years past, there was a dedication and a desire to serve Jesus. Read reports here a few months ago. A church that 50 years ago ran 500 and some in Sunday school, 50 years later, with all the new educational building works, with all their telephones, with all their automobiles, with all the advancements that we had, they had 195 in Sunday school 50 years later, when it used to run 550 some. Thou art dead. Thou hast a name, but thou art dead, you see. All right? Now, he said this unto them. In verse 2, he said, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, he said, Be watchful. In other words, be watchful and watching against sin and against Satan. Go over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here's the Apostle Paul has written this epistle to Timothy. And he said this in verse 13. Hold fast. Notice, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good things which were committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. See the office of the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits speaking through to the seven stars unto the church of the true and the living God. Now they had be watchful against sin and Satan. He says strengthen the things that remain. In other words strengthening the missionary program that they might reach out and evangelize and win men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the world. Strengthen the things which have remained. Strengthen one another in the fact of love and unity and working for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen these things because right now all the way around you is setting the universal deadness of piety is all around. A woman told me today, I said, have you been saved, born again, born in the Spirit of Christ? She said, I go to the Congregational Church. I said, have you ever been saved, born again, born in the Spirit of Christ? She said, I believe that I'm satisfied with my church. I said, well, we'd like to invite you out. Have you ever accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and put your trust in his shed blood? And she said, well, I believe it's my own business where I go to church. And it's my own business 
uh, what I think. I said, she said, there's, I have my way, you have your way. I said, no, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, ye must be born again. She said, well, I have my own ways, and that's my privilege to believe as I want. That's right. That's right. She declared the very thing that had tried to get through people's head and the lost talk about it and don't know what they're saying. That's right. You have your privilege to think and do what you want, but it doesn't say you're right. God said you are a free moral agent. And boy, if you get this in people's head, they sit back and say, well, uh, uh, you have the right to do and think what you want. If I'm wrong, one day God will just turn on the big blue lights and they'll flash and lightning bolts will strike me and that'll mean God wants me to get saved. Not so. God said you are a free moral agent and if you so choose, I'm using the, the word you, I'm speaking, I know teaching in a class with our people, but what I'm speaking about is when you're talking to somebody like that, that is right, you have the right to choose if you want to go to hell. And this is the thing. This is what they're talking about. Deadness all around us. Do what you want to do. Go to the church of your choice. Well, I'll tell you, the church of your choice had better be a choice for one that's preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and telling about an exalted Jesus if you want to go to heaven. It's that simple. They'll go where they want. They can do what they want to. That's right. But remember, O oh man, for all this, thou shalt be brought into judgment. Pray for this lady, 60-some years old. I'll go where I want to go. But when death takes that soul, if she never comes to Jesus, she's going where she didn't want to go. She went where she wanted to in this life. She went where they wouldn't, wouldn't stomp on sin. She went to where they wouldn't exalt the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. She went to where they wouldn't holler about dancing, drinking, cussing, carrying on. She went to this in this life. And that's where I want to go. But when she winds up in hell, she's going to say, Oh, why didn't I listen? Rich man in hell, son, remember thou in thy lifetime received the good things. You had what you wanted. Yes, sir, beloved, free moral agents, all right? So he says, strengthen the things that remain. Remain. He said that remain in that second verse that are ready to die. Strengthen the things that are still here. In other words, we're getting down to the point. He said, take hold of the pump of God's word and harness the old gospel hose up onto their dying souls that need to be rejuviated and filled with the power of God and pump the gospel message into them and get them straightened out. That which remained that is ready to die. Look, I looked about this and this come to me tonight. I went in and have looked at men and women in, in the hospitals and such and they are about to die because they need oxygen so they shove the tubes up here and turn on their oxygen pumps, put them into the nostrils or may use a mask, but they will pump oxygen into them. God says we need to pump the gospel message into churches and in the men and women that have claimed the name of Jesus Christ but will not separate and fill themselves for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it still remains that they are ready to die, pump the message into them. And rejuviate them because they're in a cold formality now and they're about to go into deadness before the throne of God as far as a gospel message. And we need to pump the word into them. Now you can take it and use it with the lost. We watch so many things. Oh, when I get to look at something, I walk down the hospital corridor sometimes, see somebody there with an intravenous jar. They got it plugged into them. What they doing? They're pumping some liquid into them. Maybe it's got medicine in it. Maybe it's the food. It's the only way they're going to feed. If you look over on the other side and hear somebody else and they got a, a blood plasma bottle hanging up here and they're pumping blood into them. But what that soul needs is have the gospel message pumped into them until it fills them and until they are, are filled and strengthened lest they die. So he says, be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, I have not found thy works perfect before God. They had a big name. They had nice looking work going. But he said, 
I found that thy works are not perfect before God. No care for lost souls. Nobody wanted to pray. Nobody wanted to take time to read the Bibles. The fact is that there they sat. Here is a shell, but there's no kernel in it. Just a shell. And we find that many times that these things are, are brought forth, that the works are hollow and empty. In other words, a church without the Holy Spirit. They have not let the Holy Spirit work in the church and in the lives of people. And therefore it has a shell, but it's hollow spiritually and empty before the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he said, remember and be watchful. Now notice what he said in verse 4. Or verse 3 rather, excuse me. Verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Verse 3 there he said, Remember that thou hast received and heard. Over in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 58. Paul said this, as he was expounding here to the church at Corinth. Verse 58, that 15th chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, Christian, put a circle around that verse and really get it down into your heart. The trials rail, and people are, are against you. Go back and read that. Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. Done for the Lord, it's not in vain. And boy, you can really take this and always abounding in the work. Always abounding in his grace. Best thing to do when you get down in a spiritual slump, I might say, is just go out and start knocking doors and telling people about Jesus. Get down there and it just seems like, like everything's going wrong. Brother Baird, Stan Baird, he said, what? He's out here on Peacock Road, way out here. He said, Who, who'd you have out there? Seen the car park? Well, I was out calling. I was in a spiritual drought, so I just pulled the car over and prayed and hopped out of the car and started going up and down the farm knocking doors, telling people about Jesus. How many have we reached out of that? I haven't seen any of them yet. But I talked with a man in Flint, uh, a preacher in Flint, Brother Doug, a lay preacher, going to have May the 2nd, going to speak for him while I'm in the revival meeting. But there's a fellow that's out here on Peacock Road that knows about that nut over at Bath Baptist Church. <laughs> well, I'll knock him door. He'd never come out. But a line's starting to run in from somebody else that knows us. You never know. It says, knowing that your labor is not in vain. You go out and sow the seed. I was talking with an old saint the other day, last week. Preached the gospel years ago. It's the first time I had met him. And he said this. He lives over here on US 27. And he said, uh, my brother's got one of these big high-powered machines. The combines, self-propelled, big swath it takes and everything. He says, I'm thankful that the Lord sent you out here in this community. He says, it's small. But he says, I remember how that years ago when he said there was nine of us on the farm and we didn't waste anything. And he said, I remember how we used to go out and cut the grain with a sickle and the cradle on it. Now he said, Dad didn't want anything wasted. And in the fence rows, some of you without telling your age, probably remember when they used to have just a big fence post, just be a big round log, saw it off. See, Sister Helen's nodding her head. <laughs> I give her age deduction. No. Uh, so <laughs> here that big post and such, and as they sowed the seed, it went around the post and such. And he said that dad didn't go out there with a little hand sickle and reach in there and get the clump 
of, of the grain and cut it with that sickle. Didn't waste any of it. He said these big high-powered uh, geared churches that are preaching the gospel, he said they may take over a big city, but somebody got to get out there around the fence row with a little sickle and, and get around and don't waste anything. I said, man, preacher, that's a good illustration. Boy, couldn't you preach on, on uh, uh, Ruth out there gleaning in the fields as Boaz looked out to her and told the reapers, he said, uh, leave, leave along the fence rows there. Don't get too close to it. Leave it so she can go out and pick. So I see, he loved her, concerned about her. Jesus says, go out and reap the harvest. Oh, that, that grain, and this really jarred my mind when he said that because that grain, I realized, along that fence row will grow just as tall and it's just as good a grain as what's out in the middle of that field. But the big high-powered machine goes by it. Somebody's got to go glean the fence rows. And it encouraged me as he said this. What's, what am I saying that for? This is what Paul said. Know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I've heard him say as that the preaching of the word, and I've mentioned this before, they say God didn't call me to be successful, he called me to be faithful. Well, beloved, if you are faithful, you are bound to be successful. It's bound to be. If you're faithful to the Lord, he's going to bless you. Just because a man told me, he said, well, you know, Noah preached over there for 120 years and never got a convert outside of his own family. That's all right. I realize he was faithful in doing what he wanted. But uh, I don't believe, nor do I intend to preach 120 years and get eight converts and just be satisfied because there was eight souls, my own and seven other. If that's all that I could get to, fine. But that doesn't mean I'm to be satisfied. If it did, my goodness, we're way ahead of schedule this year already. Well, I sat down, my goodness. See? But he was faithful in what God gave him to do and continued at it. Done the work. Why? He was busy there building a boat while he was preaching. And he was showing a type of Christ while he was preaching, even though they laughed at him. Didn't make any difference. He prepared what God told him to do. So knowing not that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, knowing the fact that God's going to bless. All right? We find here that the fact he said receiving and holding that which has been heard unto you, what you've received and heard. In other words, remember how welcome was that gospel message of grace of God the day that you were saved? Have you looked back at that in the last day or week or so? Remember the joy that flooded your soul when you knew that God had taken the condemnation for your, from your sin-sick soul and had given you a mansion in glory? Oh, John, here on the Isle of Patmos, he said, remember that. Remember and hold to that, what you've heard, the great grace and gospel message. Man said, well, I'm saved. We talked to him in the hospital, he's a big shot. He said, told him that the church was just a church just like his mom and dad's church was up in Detroit. He said, well, I'll tell you. He said, I've heard that hell, fire, and brimstone preaching and I've got saved, and now I'm saved, and I want to go hear a little more of the intellectual preaching now. Well, that old hellfire and brimstone preaching was good enough to get him saved, but he didn't want to take his family to it, that as his kids reared, they might get saved. Makes you begin to wonder. It was a good song and a good gospel message. He liked it then. John said, remember this thing. The old song that they sing, the old, give me the old time religion. It was good enough for Paul and Silas. It was good enough for the Philippian jailer. It was good enough for Nicodemus. It was good enough for the thief on the cross. And sure, praise God, it's good enough for me. You can't elaborate on the old gospel message. Talked about the old gospel song of when the saints go marching in. They geared it over to formalism and deadness. And what do they call it? When the saints go wiggling in taking the gospel songs that have been set forth in our hymn books and have set them to bebop and such and playing them in the churches. Thou art dead. Formalism. Hear it to the world. All right, he says, that's what you first receive, that gospel message, the grace of God to our hearts. 
Then he said, hold fast. Hold fast. In other words, the word that's been given unto you, keep it in God's will for his powers and his blessings. You're going to have the blessing of God? Hold fast to the gospel message and to the word that God has given unto you. You want to have blessings? Do what God wants. Want to have blessings? Listen to the word of God and let it saturate your heart and then do what God wants you to do. Then he said, stand. Hold fast and stand. Now, when we get down into this fact that the hold fast and standing, it said you received and hold fast, and then if you stand for it, it's easy to compromise to get members. It's easy. Let me show you. Man said, Tommy says, if, uh, if I come to your church to join it, you're going to tell me I've got to be baptized, what you call scripturally. I said, that's right, brother. He said, well, I'm satisfied with my baptism. I said, well, you may be. But I said, I'd have to be very truthful with you. The Lord's not satisfied with it. He said, but if I join your church, I am going to have to do what you want. He just said, I didn't say what I want. I said, God's not pleased with it. Now, that man's not angry with me. He hasn't joined the church. And if he does, he'll be scripturally baptized before he does. Is he saved? Yes. I don't doubt his salvation. All right. It would be easy to say, well, as long as you're satisfied about it. After all, that's between you and God. And so therefore, uh, we'll, we'll receive you into the fellowship of our church. I would be compromising. Because I know he's not scripturally baptized. So I'd be compromising. Somebody else comes along and uh, they say, uh, like, seeing as we're in a bond issue, a lady told me one time as I went and called on her, uh, in fact, on the other side of Lansing, uh, called it, they talked to her, went in there. She said, she, well, she was all set. I'll buy $10,000 worth of bonds. Fine. Started getting out the reservation slip. And she said, now, uh, of course, I want you to buy a new organ. I wait a minute, wait a minute, ma'am. This is a business transaction. She said, well, if I can't designate what I want, I'm not going to invest $10,000. I said, then you're not going to invest $10,000. I said, this investment is a business transaction. It is not telling you that you can tell us what you want us to do. If you want to talk about buying a, a, an organ for the church, all right, you come. And she was saved, claimed to be. I said, you come and unite with the church and you'll have a voice. If you want to buy the organ and that's the way the church moves, then you can go ahead and buy an organ. Not, with a, not through the bond issue, but you can go ahead and buy it. She said, well, if I, if I can't do some designation, I'm not going to invest. I said, well, bless your heart, that's all right. So she didn't invest. So what was the difference? It wasn't the fact, it wouldn't have made any difference if we were going to buy a brand new organ. She still wasn't going to tell us what you're going to do. It's easy to compromise. And I said, well, if, you, if you cut your message off 10 minutes, I'll come every week. I said, all right. What am I going to do? Compromise? <laughs> here I am, point seven. Uh oh, <laughs> I got to cut off ten minutes here. Well, that takes off the invitation and everything. Bless you, Louis. Don't worry about uh, getting that invitation him. We just don't have time. I've got to cut my message. That's so that uh, John Dopes will come to church every Sunday. It sounds silly, but this is what it is. Stand fast. It's easy to compromise and get numbers. But I'll tell you, the numbers don't necessarily show the work of the Lord. The numbers as we begin to look at it, so many are thriving around it. Certainly we want to see numbers, as I said, if they're coming the right way. But he said here after you heard, hold fast and repent. Repent. Here's the clutch. Repent. 
Oh, how the churches hate to do that. How the church hates to repair. With a church with 10 to 1,100 members and a revival meeting going to be held and announced for a prayer meeting on a Saturday night and there was 22 people come to pray and it had a 20-some staff of officers. Shame upon it. In the fact that out of over a thousand people, 22 people come out to pray for revival. Well, God gave us revival in spite of the other, what, uh, 9,900 and something? Uh, in spite of that, we had 69 sa souls saved in five nights. God was gracious. But what are we getting at? The fact that God said, repent. Churches don't want to do it. People don't want to do it. They say, well, I'll not bow down my knee and I will not repent. That is not what I feel I want to do. Well, that's all right. But I'll tell you, most people are just like Judas Iscariot. He was sorry that his conscience caught up with him when he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was not sorry that he sold out the Lord. He got down and he repented. Repented what? He said he repented himself. He went out and hung himself. And there's many, many people that are repenting because their conscience convict them and they are caught in it and they say, I'm sorry, but it's not a godly repentance and they might as well figure they're spiritually hanging themselves too. Judas Iscariot was caught. So he went out and hung himself. We find that God has went on here. And he said this, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I shall come upon thee. If thou shalt not watch. Now I've got to look at that tonight. Talking about a second coming here. And we could say, but, but preacher, does the scripture say that he's going to come as a thief in the night? No man knoweth the hour? That's right, that's what it says. But he said, if therefore... Thou shalt not watch. He said, I will come as a thief in the night. Well, beloved, if Jesus comes tonight, as far as in my heart and in my home, he's not going to come as a thief in the night because we're looking for him. We don't even lock the doors. <laughs> of course, the rapture won't make any difference. But the fact is that watching and looking for Jesus, a lot of people aren't. What are they doing? They don't believe he's coming tonight. They don't expect him to come tomorrow. They don't expect him to come on Sunday evening. Why? They'd be in church if they did. They'd sure rather be sitting here in the church when the Lord raptured us than sitting out someplace other than the house of the Lord. Isn't that right? Amen? Amen. Certainly. So we begin to think about this. Read it down. He said... They're not watching. He said, and if you do not watch, I will come as a thief in the night. Then it's too late to repent of the things that they have not been doing for the cause of Christ. I will come as a thief. Then it's too late to win that lost one to the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to hell without Jesus. We find that then it's too late to come into the church and get on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Too late. In 1 Thessalonians... Chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we'll take verses about 1 through 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Now listen to this, beloved, as God begins to speak here. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. In other words, uh, the time's coming. Times and the seasons are set forth. We get through the book of Revelation. If we get through it before the rapture, and I'm looking for the Lord, we may not make it. But if we get through the book of the Revelation even, and such, the fact that you will begin to see the signs on every hand for preparation that Jesus could come. The signs are filled. Now, he didn't say, I'll come in 1965. He didn't say, I'll come in 1966. But he said, I'm coming. Watch. Apostle Paul was looking for him back there in his day. 
But it's from the Apostle Paul's time until tonight, many, many prophecies have been filled that could have never been in Paul's time. But Paul wasn't worried about it. He was looking for him. So we find here, but at the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, and boy, listen to this, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. You know, the world's talking about peace. About the time they say, peace, peace. Sudden destruction. Great pain and anguish. Said as a woman travail with child. You mothers know what he means. The anguish, the pain, and the travail. He said in verse 4 as he went on. But ye brethren are not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. You see. He said you are not in the darkness that it should overtake you as a thief. Because that's what he said in Revelation. If you will not do these things, I will come as a thief. But he said, if you are watching and are in prayer and watching what's going on, he says that day should not overtake you as a thief. Verse 5, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Man hateth the light, neither cometh the light because his deeds are evil. See, But he said, we're not in darkness. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a, an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Says there's no sense in us being overtaken. If we do the work of the Lord, He'll not overtake us as a thief in the night. All right, verse 4 of Revelation chapter 3. He said, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All right, we find here that thank God for the faithful few. Thank God for the Sunday night. Members of the Bath Baptist Church. Thank God for the Wednesday night members of the Bath Baptist Church. On Sunday morning, you see those that love the preacher. On Sunday night, you see those that love the church. On Wednesday night, you see those that love the Lord. And you mark it down and watch it. Thank God for the faithful few. Always the remnant is there. So we find here that how that they have and set aside the few, these few that want to do God's work. And they have this few in every age and in every church. And it said they have the garments of salvation. Isaiah 61.10, he says, He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Give you the location of the scripture. Must move along so that I can close out this tonight. But in Isaiah 61.10, where he speaks of the robes, of salvation, the garment. And then we find that in here in verse 5, he gives his promise. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white remnant, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, I want you to notice and comes along and says he's going to blot the names out. He said, I will not blot out his name. To who? To he that overcometh. All right, how did I overcome it? I gave this before and I give it again and again. 1 John 5, 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5. Who is he that overcometh, but he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now that believing with a heart, as God has set forth. All right, he that overcometh. Now it does not say 
he that overcometh the things of this world shall inherit. But he said, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And the only way to overcometh is by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ through salvation and trust in Jesus Christ. He that overcometh, just like the prodigal son. In the book of Luke, I want you to notice, in the book of Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son, watch when he began to realize what he was at and what condition that he was in. This is the thing when a person realizes, as a prodigal son did in chapter 15 of the book of Luke, when he realizes that he is undone and that he is filthy and that he is in an ungodly condition and that he has forsaken and turn and try to walk away from his father and when he realizes that and comes to the position in the place where he wakes up and looks at what God's got I don't care if you take the prodigal son as a man with all kinds of wealth or whatever you want to take him but in verse 17 I want you to notice that 15th chapter and when he came to himself he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I said, I'm going to get up and go. You know, falling down is one thing, Christian. I hear people say, oh, I've tried, I've tried, and I just keep falling down. Well, bless your heart, get up and brush yourself off and go again. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. But you notice that daddy didn't make him a hired servant. He said, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. How many times have we failed the Lord? I'm not worthy, Father, to be called a preacher of the gospel. Maybe as one of your servants. He said, uh-uh. What did he do? Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Oh, the father's always watching. Prodigals get out there in the hog pen of, of this old world, but God is watching and God is waiting and God is looking for them to come to themselves and arise and go to the father. And he started, but look what the father done. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He hadn't even got the words out of his mouth yet. He said what he was going to say when he got there, but old daddy was just smothering him with compassion and embracing love, kissing him and such, hugging him around the neck. Verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But, but the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Oh, yes. Father said, Robe him. They shall walk with me in white robes. He prepared him. We find how that the great love and compassion that was brought forth. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And verses 37 through 40. John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. When we hear Jesus speaking of his great work that God had, the Father had given him to do. All, now notice that, all that the Father hath given me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I want you to notice he said all that the Father give me shall come unto me. Predestination, election, and foreknown knowledge of God teaches the fact that God said he knew your structure, he knew your very body before you were conceived in your mother's womb. And he said he knows the beginning from the ending. 
Now, therefore, God knoweth all things or he's not God. And people get all confused about predestination and election. Whom God hath elected by his election grace, that some try to bring it off, that only the elect will come. But the predestination, he knew all things, but love had been given out, and he gave his son for a world of lost sinners, all that would come unto him. But he knew all things from beginning to end. Now he said this, All that the Father shall give me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should rise it up again, at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last days. He said, I've sent him. What the Father has given unto me, I will lose none of it. And the Holy Spirit said, I come to glorify the Son, and the Holy Spirit has come to seal, and we are sealed on the day of redemption, as the Bible has spoken forth. And he said, He that has upon him the robes of righteousness and has overcome by trusting and taking the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior is written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, Romans chapter 8, I won't go through it tonight, I don't have time. But Romans chapter 8 and verses 35 through 39, when he spoke about who shall separate us from the love of God. Shall tribulation, trials, distress, persecution, death, height, things present, things to come, principalities, powers, things under the earth, things above the earth, things in the earth. No, we are more than conquerors through him which loved us. And we find that as he came on down in here, this great book that we're speaking about, look over into Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And all, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The name is in the Lamb's book of life, God's great predestinated election, foreknowledge, and determined counsel. I don't have time teaching all this. I taught it when I was in the book of, Revel or book of Romans. But God said, they're written down. He knows the beginning from the end. And he said that that person... Now he's speaking here when the great power of the Antichrist and such comes on the scene. Every one that's not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to fall down and worship the Antichrist. Man says, then preacher, you believe God knew who was going to come to Christ. Yeah, I believe it. You say, then, then my goodness, then they're going to get saved regardless. Uh -uh. He said, you are to go out and tell people about Jesus. He told me I'm to preach the gospel message. I don't worry about who's elect and who's not. He told me to go out and preach the gospel, be the witness. It's the Holy Spirit that saves, and God uses human instrumentality, and he doesn't have a bunch of puppets. Get out here and do the work for God. You find that we were predestinated before the foundations of the world. But you better go through Romans 10, 13 into glory, because it's written the predestination on the other side of the door. <laughs> Romans 10, 13 is the door going in. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Walk through the door of salvation, turn around, look back. It says, you were predestinated before the foundation of the world. Someday I'll teach you again on the doctrine of election, predestination, and foreknowledge. But the book, the Lamb's Book of Life, and then Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. Notice the books that are at the white throne judgment when the dead, small and great, shall stand before God. Here in the great white throne judgment, verse 12, the 20th chapter of Revelation. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to the works. In verse 15 of that chapter, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God's three witnesses, the Holy Word of God, 
the book that told us she must be born again. The book of deeds, God's eternal accounts, written in heaven on high. Remember, I preached on my record in heaven. Sinners got a record there, too. And without Jesus Christ, one day that record book will be opened when he stands before him at the white throne judgment. And there, the word of God, the book of the Bible, the book of deeds, and the land's book of life. Why the land's book of life? Perchance is he in it? No. But there's three witnesses. Let all things be established by three witnesses. The word said ye must be born again. Like this lady told me here, I got a right to believe what I want. The book of deeds says you remember that on March the 9th, 1965 when you told my servant I got a right to believe what I want the book said ye must be born again there's the two accounts you must be born again you wouldn't accept it and here's the book of life and your name's not in it into the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone throughout eternity and the last verse of that third chapter of the book of Revelation in verse 6, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Every one of these close out with he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And that's what the world needs to know, that have an ear to hear, will listen to what the Word of God has to say to his churches. Because he said ye must be born again said ye must expound God's word and let us do it fervently as we go forth for him. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you for...